2019 has been another transformative year in gynecologic cancer as practice changing data continue to emerge in this Onc Live peer exchange discussion, my colleagues and I will discuss recent data, including that from the 2019 European Society of Medical Oncology meeting in Barcelona, Spain. We'll provide perspective on how the latest research will translate to your practice and hopefully improve patient outcomes. My name is Brad Monk. I'm a gynecologic oncologist from Phoenix, Arizona, professor of gynecologic oncology at the University of Arizona and Creighton University, and also part of the US Oncology Network. Joining me today on this distinguished panel is Dr. Kathleen Moore, uh, the uh, Virginia uh, Kinley, is that right? Curley. Curley, the Virginia Curley Cade Chair in Developmental Therapeutics, Associate Director of Clinical Research and Director of the Oklahoma TASAT Phase I Program at the Stevenson Cancer Center at the University of Oklahoma Health and Science Center in Oklahoma City. That's a mouthful. Boomer sooner. <laughs> Katie, seriously, thank you for joining Thanks us. For I know me. this is, uh, you're busy, and it's really my pleasure to have you with us. Thanks. And Dr. Robert Coleman, a professor in the Department of Gynecologic Oncology and Reproductive Medicine, Executive Director, Cancer Network Research, and the Ann Rife Cox Chair in Gynecology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. You guys need shorter titles. <laughs> Why can't I just say my good friend Katie Moore you from can. Oklahoma and, and Rob Coleman from MD Anderson? And Dr. Shannon Weston, Associate Professor and Director of Early Drug Development in the Department of Gynecologic Oncology and Reproductive Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Shannon, thank you. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, Dr. Michael J. Beer, uh, Professor of Medicine, Hematology and Oncology and the Evelina B. Spencer Chair in Oncology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in Birmingham, Alabama. Thanks, Brad. You're welcome and thank you. So thank you for joining me. Let's begin. We're going to have a robust conversation about ovarian cancer. I'd like to start at the beginning. Always a good place. Mm -hmm. Shannon, most patients with epithelial ovarian cancer are diagnosed with advanced stages. Most patients are high-grade serous. Correct. What is the standard treatment, I think, and it's a global standard for yeah. treating newly diagnosed advanced high-grade serous ovarian, tubal, or peritoneal yeah. cancer? So our standard is going to be a combination of surgery and chemotherapy, sometimes surgery first, sometimes chemotherapy first. Of course, our goal from surgery, wherever it happens in the continuum, is to get down to no gross residual disease. Um, and from a chemotherapy standard, uh, we generally are going to use paclitaxel and carboplatin. Intravenous can also use it intraperitoneal. Um, and I think we're going to get into uh, some of the other combinations that we can, can see going forward today. Mm -hmm. and, and we've talked about intraperitoneal, how it's kind of fallen out of favor. What sort of carboplatin and paclitaxel doses? Yeah, so typically what I use is um, intravenous every three weeks, and I give the paclitaxel 175 milligrams per meter squared and carboplatin at an area under the curve of six. Okay. So, Katie, obviously there's been this emerging information about bevacizumab. Bevacizumab was FDA approved on June 12, 2018. Tell us about the opportunity uh, of bevacizumab in frontline with chemotherapy and in maintenance. So um, there are two big frontline studies that demonstrated efficacy for bevacizumab with chemotherapy, importantly, and to follow as maintenance for a variable amount of time for about a year. And in both of those studies, they're very consistent, uh, demonstrated a statistically significant and clinic clinically meaningful improvement in progression-free survival, which means the time that a patient has from the end of chemotherapy and still touch time as she recurs. So, um, so that's meaningful to patients. Uh, bevacizumab is well tolerated. There are certain subgroups that may benefit a little bit more than others. Uh, that's sort of speculative, uh, but all patients seem to benefit. And it's really become uh, uh, kind of um, the standard of care in several lines of chemotherapy uh, for our patients. And so it's a very important asset. So Michael, she mentioned there are some patients that benefit maybe biomarkers, either molecular or clinical. Who's the best candidate for frontline bevacizumab? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And we certainly have biomarkers uh, that have been developed. Uh, I like to claim uh, CD31 is an interesting one, IL-6 is in the play too, but none of them have been validated. So unfortunately, they, they really can't be used to predict who would benefit most. And I think 
most of us use sort of clinical cr criteria. You know, we have a patient that has a lot of ascites, maybe large disease, that high risk group that Icon 7 talked about. They might be patients uh, who would benefit more from this drug. And, and now with what we're gonna talk about later, I mean, the PARP inhibitors, that may evolve a little bit. So volume of disease maybe is one of the most important factors. Um, so Rob, you know, you've been very interested in this approval process. 218 was published in 2011, but it took seven years to get FDA approval. Why the delay? Why did it take seven years after the European approval to come to the United States? Uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, there's, um, I don't think it was from the basis of an efficacy standpoint, right? I think we all were really convinced of that. Um, you know, it was probably just, you know, it was a strategic move. It was the right time. There have been multiple other approvals. Um, the databases have been cleaned. Um, I think that uh, it was, uh, it was at least the right time. We felt it probably should have been sooner. Right. But, but there were a number of factors, probably not necessarily all related to science. And I think that, uh, you know, that, those are, you know, things that we had to deal with. One of the, the things that I've heard you say before is that, you know, 11, 10 years, nine years ago, that there was an opportunity to perhaps per improve overall survival. And it took an evolution of the thought process that progression-free survival was probably a more reliable and relevant endpoint because of the long post-progression survival. Y you agree with that, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and it's, it's a key because it, it, it really impacts about the, the way that we design trials. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to address an OS endpoint, you really have to overpower it for the more immediate endpoints. And you and I have talked about this many times. That, um, that you run the risk of having a significant but not clinically meaningful endpoint as you overpower for an endpoint that may take three years to, to achieve. So the overall survival endpoint you know, had been linked obviously to approval in the past. Yes. And so now I think we've been convincing that these more earlier endpoints are more informative and later endpoints can be d confounded by subsequent uh, drugs. And Brent, yeah. the, 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 the irony here was the EMA approval use the 218 data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, so there are two studies, one European ICON-7 and one American GOG-218, and the Europeans used the American study. I, I think it's really because of the American study was placebo-controlled and had all the bells and whistles, and I've already said it takes two you know, studies to convince anyone of anything, and, and those two studies really were complementary.